word of prayer. We took re uh, prayer request this morning before Sunday school. Perhaps you have another request. And if you'll notice on your prayer sheet, Sister Ruth put on there, fill up your surgery on the 24th, if you make it to the 24th. I think that's what you told me this morning. So we're going to be praying much for you. Uh, Sister Lola's at home. Her surgery was successful. She told me yesterday that she was seeing a whole lot better. Her eye was better. And we're thankful for that. Any other requests other than what's on the prayer sheet? Every heart and mind clear. Brother Jeremy, lead us in prayer, if you would. Sing. During this month, of course, we are looking toward the end of the month when we celebrate Easter and what a time for Christians to celebrate the fact that the Lord died for us and Amen. provides a way for us to be able to go to heaven to live with Him. Uh, and we're going to sing an old, two old songs this morning Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. <laughs> down. Let me just welcome each one, make it official. It's good to see each one of you here uh, this morning. And I was asking Jim, bring you had enough rain? I think we all agree we, we've had a, had a plenty, but you know the Lord always sends what we need. I think about the underground water table because I've got a well and those have springs and, and it helps it a whole lot, you know. But uh, again, a very special welcome to each and everyone here this morning. 
Uh, do remember our, our prayer meeting tonight at uh, uh, prayer meeting old church service tonight at five o'clock. Come a little bit early. Uh, we always have a little bit of, of fellowship. I always want some <clears throat> something to snack on downstairs. So keep that in mind. Wednesday evening is prayer meeting at six thirty. Uh, I see most everybody it looks like run the clock up an hour. So that's a good sign, uh, you know. Also remember next Sunday is a special Sunday. It's Palm Sunday. You know, that's the Sunday that Jesus Christ made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which would cultivate in the end of the week, of course, uh, to his death, uh, burial, and, of course, resurrection beyond that. So remember next Sunday and also Easter Sunday is the 27th. You know, sometimes you can get folks to come on Easter when they won't come any other time. And we're glad to have them any time they come, they get to hear the word. So keep that in mind. That's on the 27th. And then uh, the following Sunday, which will be April the 3rd through uh, April the 6th, Sunday morning through Wednesday night, Dr. Ken Riggs will be here uh, preaching a revival uh, for us. So those are about all the announcements that we have, unless someone has something else. Uh, it's good to have the newlywed here, Brother Carlos, this morning. God bless you, brother. If you would, uh, maybe our ushers would come at this time. Let's see, Jim's gone. Brother Carlos, would you stand in for Brother? Okay. Would you bless our tithes, our tithes and offerings? this with you. I, I didn't know this. It says, Brother Tommy, thanks for serving our country and being a man of God. Thank you lots, Anna and, and Charles. Oh my, isn't that pretty? She made me, we call them an African. I call it an American. It was made by an American. Isn't that pretty? I've got the last one that you made. We still, well, I can, I can replace that. And notice the colors, red, white, and blue. I call it, thank you very, very much. Isn't that nice? I really appreciate that so very, very much. Listen, uh, you know, she put a lot of work into that. I know that because I talked to her before about how much work she had put into that, uh, you know. At this time, uh, Sister Judy and Sister Linda is going to provide our special music. Boy, it's so pretty, red, white, and blue. Amanda, be sure I put that on the sofa today. My granddaughter will go home and eat with us. Mike, is this mic on? It's on. It's on. Um, but our Sunday school lesson uh, was basically about the Sabbath, and uh, I think that's partially what this song's about, or maybe wholly what it's about. Um, God truly made the Sabbath for man, and isn't it great that we can come to church and be with our Christian brothers and sisters and listen to a message from his word and to me, that's the refueling we need as human beings as we go through this world. Those other six days, we have to be out with the world and we have to be challenged by all the things that are bad, but it's so wonderful to be able to come and be with our Christian brothers and sisters and truly feel the presence of the Lord in this place. I'm glad that he's also going with us when we go out the door. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs>
If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. May I share with you this morning, the message this morning is a sad message. I think you'll see what I mean as we begin to unfold what the Lord has laid upon our heart. And I hope you'll leave your Bibles open. Matthew chapter 7. We'll start reading in verse 13. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. And here's the message. These next three words. Stop and think about it. Not everyone, and that's the title of the message, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And, it, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Father, as we take a few minutes this morning and break the bread of life, I pray the devotional thought that you've given to us to share this morning would be beneficial and helpful to all that are gathered in this place this morning. Speak to our hearts together. I think all of us, Lord, know what the term and what the word inventory means. And sometimes it's good as God's people to stop, call time out, and just take an inventory. Dear Lord, where am I standing this morning in relationship to you? And I pray that before we close this service this morning, if there's anyone that's not sure where they stand with the Lord, if they're not sure of their relationship with you, may they make a positive statement of the fact that they've sinned, come short of the glory of God. And Lord, may you forgive their sins, heal their hearts, and give them a good home in heaven when this life is over. We'll be careful to thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. Leave your Bibles open. May I say again to you, this is a very, very sad message. And the main reason that I call your attention to these facts I just read is that many people, I'm talking about many, many people feel you know, that they're going to heaven in fact, this is true in many churches. It's absolutely not biblical, dearly beloved. Listen, look at our text. Verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. You see, it is the will of the Father that every boy, every girl, every mom and dad be saved and go to heaven. That's what he wills for you because he gave the best heaven had to offer his son to die in our place. And then he says in verse 24, Therefore, in other words, having said this, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will like him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. So if you follow the will of the Lord and do what you need to do in relationship to the Lord, you can be saved and go to heaven uh, when you die. He said in verse 23, and then will I profess unto them, notice, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Did you see it? 
There it is, you know, in the Bible. Again, look at verse 21. Not everyone. Think about that. That's why I said in my prayer, sometimes it's good, you know, as God's people to stop, like in basketball, call time out, and take a self-inventory where you are in your relationship to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, do you pray? Do you read your Bible? Are you faithful? Do you witness for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And I could go on down, down the line. But, but notice, he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Simply putting it, and this is about it, I guess as frank a statement as you can make, not everyone's going to heaven. Do you know that? And you know, that's sad. That's why I said it's sort of a sad me message, you know. First, notice, uh, these verses tell us very emphatically that not everyone will be sa saved. Now, they can be, but they won't. Some people have absolutely made the conscious decision to reject Jesus Christ. I've worked with folks like that. I've seen folks like that. They know there's a God. They know about Jesus Christ, but consciously they have made a decision that they're not going to heaven. They're going to step out into eternity unprepared to meet God and give an account before him in which having not been saved then, they're in an awful deplorable condition because they're going to step over into that awful place uh, that we call hell. You know, some people, as we said, just make a conscious decision not to uh, be saved and they reject Jesus Christ. You know, I've heard people say this, oh, preacher, don't worry about it. We're all God's children. That's not true. We're all God's creation, but we're not all God's children. We need to make that clear. Uh, you know, listen, John said in chapter, or Jesus said in John chapter one in verse 12, he said, but as many as receive him to them become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You can be a child of God if you desire to be a child of God. How, you know, it's sad. Isn't it sad when you think about it? Not everyone is going to go to heaven. You, you know, sometimes walking through the store, like most folks getting gross. I think sometimes in my thought, maybe that's the preacher's thought, I don't know. I wonder how many folks, there must be several hundred people in and around the generation. I wonder how many of these folks are saved. I wonder how many are going to go to heaven. And I think about that. And then when I read this great passage of scripture, it reminded me how sad there are folks who are going to miss heaven and make hell their home. And they made that decision consciously on their own. Secondly, there will be more people die lost then are saved. Do you realize that? Let me read you a couple of verses to you. Notice in verse 13 and 14 of Matthew 7. Notice, he said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Notice what Jesus said, And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. He said, Many people are going to be destroyed by burning eternally in a place called hell. And he said, the, the narrow way, fewer people are traveling the narrow way. And you stop and think and just look around. And you know it, I know it, and it's the truth. And we're living in a day, listen, there have been people who have said, you, you know, they're a good person. Uh, I, I think probably, let me, I may have uh, maybe several years ago mentioned it. I believe the, the best excuse which is not Bible, okay, by the way, I believe I've ever heard. I visited a fellow one time, and uh, I, I liked that. I liked his family now, but he wasn't saved and didn't plan on getting saved. So I, I got him cornered one day up there at the house. His wife had gone to work something. We was talking. I said, uh, might I ask you, I, I've been out here and witnessed and talked to you about the Lord a number of times, and you don't come to church. You're still not saved. He said, well, don't you know, uh, what the situation is. I said, what's the situation? He said, here's the way it is. He said, now listen, in heaven, he said, I finally figured this thing out. And uh, he said, in heaven, God has a, a great scale. And he said, when I die, he's going to put me on that scale. If I've done a lot of good things, he said, you know, I don't drink, I don't cuss, I don't smoke. I'm a good provider for my family. I work hard. I don't know. I'm going to be on the good side. But now if I 
did all these evil and maybe vices in life, I'd be on the bad side and I wouldn't make it. I said, well, that's interesting. Could you maybe give me a, ver a chapter and a verse for that? I've never read that in the Bible, uh, you know. He said, well, now, you know, I don't know the Bible. That's just what I think. I said, but you see, what you think is not sufficient to get you to heaven. I could never, qu I've watched your life. I've been your family's pastor for several years, and I know you're a good man, but goodness is not sufficient to get you to heaven. You've got to see yourself as God sees you. You're lost. You've got to bend your knee, bow your head, and confess the fact that Jesus Christ is God's son and confess your sins. He's the one that will take care of his precious blood. Uh, and I've thought about that a whole lot. You know, if, being, if just being good was good enough, then Jesus would have died in vain. You see, it takes more than morality to be a Christian. I, I don't question Mr. Minifield's life no question, man, I, you, I mean, he was a great moral man, but he was lost. Far as I know, he died lost. So I reckon he's on one of them scales up yonder if there be such a thing, but that's what he thought. But you see, it doesn't measure up with the word of God. The fact is, he just didn't want to go to church. He just didn't want to come to an altar. He was too prideful in what he had to bend his knee, bow his head, and confess the fact that he, even though he was a good moral man, he had sent, was still a sinner and needed Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. We all have sin. Nearly blood, we all need a Savior. Jesus died to save us. In reality, we all need Jesus. I need him. You need him. All of us need Jesus Christ. Third, we learn from these verses the sad fact that many who are expecting to be saved will be lost. Notice in your Bibles, if you would, again, chapter 7, uh, look at verse 22. Notice what Jesus says here. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils or demons? And in thy name done many uh, wonderful uh, works? And it says in verse 23, and then will I profess unto them, he, Jesus speaks to them and says, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Think about that. You know, sometimes we need to stop, inventory, and realize something. You know, our salvation is sort of like a marriage, you know, because we now have one name, one home, one spiritual family, and Jesus Christ, he is the head of everything. Uh, for example, you now have his personality. You love what he loves, and we're, or we're supposed to anyway. See, you, you love Jesus Christ, you know, is, is the son of God. He's the light of this world. In him in all, is no darkness at all, you, you see. And we love him, and we love his word. But so many, many people never pick up the grand old book of heaven, the sacred pages of God's word, and never read the Bible. Very few people even have a Bible, we're told. What a sad thing. You know, it's important to understand something important. You don't get saved after death. Some said, but what this fellow was saying, you know, really, I'm going to be on that good side of that scale and I'll be all right with the Lord, but I'm going to get it over yonder. But that ain't what Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 18. He tells us, if you do not believe on Jesus Christ, you're already condemned, John 3, 18. Think about that. You're already under condemnation, and that word means guilt. You stand guilty before God. And listen, if you die, you'll go out into eternity and stand before God guilty. Guilty as charged because you have not confessed your sins and trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You know, isn't that a sad passage of Scripture when you stop and think about it? But let me just share a couple other good things. Notice, and he said, Beware of false prophets, which, this verse 15, which come to you in sheep's clothing, for they inward, inwardly, they are uh, ravaging wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of, of thistles? So every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. You can make the analogy between a man that loves the Lord, he's bringing forth good fruit. He's a man that loves the word. He's a man that's in church. He's a man that if he has any talent, he uses that talent for the Lord. But then if you walk down the street, you can see all manner of people who do not go to church, don't read their Bible. They're not interested in the Lord, things of that general nature. In fact, 
You know, the uh, prisons are full of them. Think about that. Boy, how, how sad. So many people. And he goes on to say, again, not everyone. Therefore, he says, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. He said, if you will follow what I am teaching to you, you are building your house on a solid foundation. It's very important if you're going to build a house or a structure, structure of any weight to have a good, solid foundation. And if we're going to enter into heaven, we've got to have a good, solid foundation. Generally, it's concrete, several feet deep and rebar and so forth and all to build those blocks or brick, whatever you're going to use for your foundation up to be solid so when the winds blow and the storms come, you know, your house is on a solid rock. It's not on just on sand, uh, you know, but on a solid rock. That's very, very important. You know, I was always amazed. Most of you know I passed over at Charlotte for a number of years. And I remember while I was there, we decided to remodel the church. And we built on to the church and put bathrooms in the church. It had bathrooms in the church. Two outhouses we had propped up with two limbs, though, that came from rolling off down the side of the hill. But anyway... Um, when we got ready to do this work, my brother David Hicks was our contractor, him and his brother. Uh, boy, they did a super good job. But anyway, uh, he called me one day. I came in and said, I want to show you something. Yeah, what's that? He said, I want to show you something. Look what this uh, church is sitting on. What's it sitting on? But they had hewed rock or stone. It, it must have been two foot thick and several feet wide. And that's what they had used instead of building up cinder block. They, that's what they used for foundation. And that's what that big, but, but Bob, that's what that church was sitting on. So when Brother Hicks and us uh, we took in, and uh, put cinder block and redone the church, guess what? We left that one on the front corner. Sort of, you know, they could tell the children, grandchildren, look, look what these folks back in uh, 1899, look what they hewed that rock out of side of the hills down there somewhere, and that's what they set the church on. So we left that. But it was on a solid, he said, listen, we'll underpin this thing, but all of it, we don't need to do nothing else. I said, man, look under there. That thing's on a solid foundation. Uh, you know, it, he, he said, I think of all the storms and winds that's come through. It's never moved, that church. It's still sitting here. They'd even put a, they have an unusual type of scene. They'd put barbs across there to hold the church together in storms. But the church was solid. And, and you know, if you will put your trust, your faith and your confidence, and your belief in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross at Calvary, your foundation is solid. Do you know that? And, and you know, if you die, you've got a better place to go. If Jesus Christ comes back, you're prepared to meet him. And that's more important than any decision that you can ever make in this life. You will make a lot of important decisions. You make a decision as to who your mate's going to be, husband or wife. You make a decision about the job, maybe, where you're going to work. You make decisions about school, maybe furthering your education to college, things like that. We make a lot of important decisions. What, what kind of car are you going to buy? Can you pay for it? A lot of things, you know. But I marvel sometimes that so few pe people make the most important decision, and that's to follow our Lord and Savior of Jesus Christ. So it's urgent for you to realize, uh, you know, this could be your last opportunity this morning. You don't never know. You know, um, there was a, 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 a great man of God uh, by the name of Dr. Hammond Appleman. Uh, he, he was a Jew who turned to Jesus Christ. And you know, I, I remember reading about him when I was in college many years ago. And uh, I read something that he, he wrote that just impressed me and really touched my heart. He said that um, God had called him to preach. He was a converted Jew. Uh, and he told a story uh, about a group of young men. He had a rather large congregation and uh, he was preaching to them. But there was a group of young men who sat on the back back there and all during his preaching, uh, they heckled him. They made fun of his preaching and all, and made fun of his sermon. In fact, uh, they interrupted him on several different occasions when he was trying to preach the word of God. But this wonderful man of God, he pleaded to them to turn to Jesus Christ, but they laughed, made fun, and refused and left the service laughing out loud and making a noise so everybody could, could hear them. That night, that very night, 
just in eyesight of the church, there was a terrible, terrible automobile accident just right up there at the church. And one of those men who had been one of the hecklers was tragically uh, killed. The last night of the revival, he said in his book, the ringleader of this group of young men came forward to be saved. And he told Dr. Appleman, he said, preacher, he said, you know, weeping, he said, uh, I could laugh at your sermons. I could laugh at your loud voice. I laughed at your funny accent. But he said, there's nothing funny about an open grave. Listen, God extends his grace to mankind today. Don't put him off. Call upon his name. Repent of your sins. Ask Jesus Christ to save your soul. And uh, again, I want to say, take an inventory every now and then. I do that sometimes. And I talk to the Lord in prayer. Boy, I tell you, more than anything else, I want to be sure, positive, and I am, that everything's right between me and the Lord. And you should be too. That's very, very important. Think, think again about what Jesus is saying here. Notice what he says. Not everyone. You know, that's sad. That tells me something. Somebody within our family circle, somebody maybe within our work associates, somebody that we know, a friend or a neighbor, they're not going to go to heaven. He, you know, it's very possible. He says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, <coughs> shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> Boy, that's sad. You know, I look back now and I think about my family. Maybe you've thought about your family. I think about my children, my grandchildren, and others. Based on what Jesus says here, I, I'm a little worried that maybe I might have some who may be a little shaky in that area. You don't need to be shaky in that area. If nothing else, you need to be sound and solid in the fact that Jesus Christ is your Savior and that you're saved, you know that you're saved. These things have I written unto you that believe that you may know that you are a child of God to him that believeth. You put your trust in him. You can have confidence that if you die, you'll have a better place to go to uh, this morning. Listen, this verse tells us something very important this morning. It, they're, they're, listen, not all of us are going to be saved and go to heaven. Think about that. I, I wonder sometimes about, about things like that. You, you know, I, I have come in contact with so many people through the years. And I just wish I could tell you that every last one of them had made peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But that's not true. I, I've seen people stand in the congregation at invitational time and grab the back of the pew and hold till their knuckles turn white and tears run down their cheek. Looked like they just grabbed that pew and walked out. I had a fellow tell me one Friday night in a revival I was preaching. I preached all week, preached my heart out on Friday night. And he said something like this to me. He said, Preacher, you almost got me tonight. I almost came and got saved. Before the light of another day, his wife called me. It had been a bad wreck. It was in Baptist Hospital with serious brain injury. I hustled up there, Jeanette and I. We sat by for several days, and finally he died. May I say this morning, that still bothers me. Did I, could I have preached harder? Could I have done more? I tried every way I knew that I'd ever learned to help him. And I'll never forget when I preached his funeral how they loaded him and drove him down and by his house. They wanted to stop. Her stopped for a few minutes and, and then they went on around uh, down to the graveyard where they buried him. But all through that, sir, I never said anything derogatory. I'd never do that at a funeral. I tried to comfort his wife and family. But I tell you what, that was one of the saddest funerals I believe I have ever conducted. And the reason it was so sad is because I can remember exactly what he said to me verbatim. Preacher, you almost got me tonight. I said to him, I said, Jimmy, listen, I, I, I can't do nothing but the Lord can. If you'll just, why don't you just stop tonight? We, we're going up yonder. I got several fellas. We'll have prayer and get right with He said, not tonight. I'm thinking about it, though. You made me think. I said, well, I hope and pray that you'll think enough to get right never realizing before God dawned the light on another day 
he will step out into eternity unprepared to meet God. And when I read this, when it says not everyone, then when I read what Jesus said, I never knew you. I think of folks like this. I don't know that he ever had time. I hope that maybe some way he could cry it out after the wreck to the Lord and maybe got right with God. But it doesn't look that way based on the neurosurgeon up at Baptist Hospital. He was just uh, in bad shape. Are you saved this morning? Call time out. Would you just maybe call time and stop an inventory? Where are you at this morning with the Lord? Are you saved? I mean, you know that you're saved. You're not guessing. That's not guesswork. You know you're saved. If not, Brother Bill and Sister Judy are going to come in a moment. I want to issue an invitation for you to come and be saved. Or issue an invitation if you're saved, but you're not quite sure that you're in the right relationship with him. I want to encourage you to come this morning. Isn't that a sad message? Isn't that sad? Not, you know, George, not everyone. That could be my family, your family, anybody. Father, as our pianist, song leader comes, this always breaks my heart, Lord, when I read <clears throat> this passage of Scripture. I've got friends I know that are not right with you. I think of the young man that came to my home last evening that we <coughs> talked to a long time, prayed with, got a lot of problems. But I tried to encourage and realize there wasn't a problem that the Lord couldn't manage and handle as we prayerfully head prayer together. As he goes on his way, I pray that some way, somehow, you'll help him to see that you can help him through every bad situation that he's facing. So many. And I don't want to be repetitious, but every time I read this, it breaks my heart. There are many who are not going to go to heaven when this life comes to a close. I think about Jimmy. Preacher, you almost got me tonight. I think about that. Speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. What page, my brother? 267. 267. Be standing as we sing together. 267. sit and listen to the message. You sort of inventory where you're at and you need prayer. You come this morning. Are you ready? Young man, young lady, mom or dad, individual, inventory. God loves you this morning. I could never love you like God loves you. So we sing the second verse. We can pray for you. We take the word of God and share with you. And if you need prayer this morning, Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? I'm more convinced than ever before that Jesus Christ is coming back sooner rather than later. If you need prayer, you need to come this morning. As we sing the last verse of this song, this could be your last opportunity. Think about it. This could be your last opportunity before you step out into eternity. I'll guarantee you this young man who came on Friday night had worked all week and I doubt that he'd ever give any thought about being saved. He came because his wife was a member. He came with her. Never realizing that, that very night or early morning, he'd step from this walk of life. If you need prayer, you come. Are you ready? We'll close our invitation here because we said we would. But may I encourage you real quickly, this afternoon, this week maybe, think about what is it. Stop and just think, where, where are you at with the Lord? Do you pray regularly? I hope you do. Trust you do. Believe you do. Do you read your Bible? 
Uh, you know, I've always said a verse or two a day, I have to keep the devil away, you know. So read your Bible. And if you've not been faithful, be faithful. And encourage your family to be faithful. And when all is said and done and we come to the close of this life where the Lord comes back, you've got a better place to go. We want to be dismissed from this place. Certainly, I want to thank Sister Anna again. That beautiful uh, red, white, and blue. Man, I'll, I'll have that on my sofa today. I'll have the best looking sofa in town. Uh, you know. Oh, Lord, yeah. Let's have a little word of prayer before we dismiss. I miss Billy and Brittany. I know she was having some problems paying all. You know, she's due here pretty quick. I hope that, that we'll check on when we get home, Amanda. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Browning, lead us in prayer. Have a good afternoon. Hope to see you tonight about five, huh? <laughs>